Hi, I'm Rick Neitzel. I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan School of Public Health in our Department of Environmental Health Sciences, and I'm here to talk to you for a few minutes this afternoon about an environmental hazard that's all around us, but probably one that most of us don't think of. Before I do that, though, as you're listening, if you have questions, please type them into the comments box, and I'll take a minute or two at the end of my talk to uh, tend to those. So, what if I told you there was an environmental hazard around us that was associated with things like cardiovascular disease, increased risk of heart attacks, increased blood pressure, hypertension, stroke. The same hazard is also associated with sleep disturbances, which turns out to have a lot of different uh, subsequent impacts on human health. This particular hazard is also associated with an increased risk of things like injuries and fatalities in the workplace. It's also very strongly associated with mental health disturbances and reduced cognitive uh, performance. This hazard has even been associated with a disruption of our endocrine system, which could potentially lead to things like diabetes. And finally, this environmental hazard is very strongly implicated in things like hearing loss and tinnitus, ringing or noise in your ears. Uh, what if I then further told you that this very scary sounding hazard is one that our government is doing almost nothing to protect us against? Well, like me, you'd probably be concerned, and maybe you're surprised to learn that this hazard I'm talking about is noise. So unfortunately in noise, our government is indeed not doing much to protect us and hasn't been for a number of decades now, but there are other places around the world where governments are working very hard to protect their populations. One of those places is in Europe. And so the European Union estimates that about one in four Europeans are exposed to potentially harmful levels of sound. So you can see from the graphic here, we've got a number of different impacts that are resulting from noise in Europe. The Europeans estimate that about 20 million folks who live in Europe are uh, disturbed or annoyed by noise, which may sound minor, but actually can lead to other more negative effects. Um, there's an estimated 8 million Europeans whose sleep is disturbed by noise, and again, that's associated with a lot of other very negative health impacts. In Europe, there's estimated to be 43,000 people every year who are admitted to a hospital as a result of some of the health impacts I've already talked about. And finally, there are 10,000 deaths or more per year in Europe resulting from noise exposure. So this is not just making people sick, it's actually resulting in deaths. Now, I don't mean to present noise as a new issue, it's not. You may have seen in the popular press recently that there are many folks who are concerned about children getting a hearing loss as a result of listening to MP3 players. I will say in my own childhood, uh, when the Sony Walkman was introduced, there were similar concerns about children getting hearing loss. Uh, that never really materialized, but we do know that MP3 players today uh, have an ability to play for much longer and at much higher volumes than we've had historically. But again, this is not something we've just started thinking about. If we go back in time to the 1970s, many cities around the United States, including the city of New York, pictured here, had programs in place, mostly funded by our Environmental Protection Agency, to measure noise and identify noise sources and reduce them and make the public safer and more healthy. Again, going back to the 1950s, there were concerns about the um, introduction of amplified rock and roll potentially causing hearing loss. But we can go back even further than that. Here's a photo from the 1920s in New York City, folks making a measurement of noise levels right in Times Square. And we don't have to just go to the last century, we could actually go back hundreds of years. We've known for longer than that, that people who work uh, forging metal, for example, have a very high risk of hearing loss. Likewise, we know that soldiers over the ages have uh, developed a hearing loss as a result of being exposed to explosions, for example. So I'd like to take just a moment now and play for you some video and audio clips. Uh, what I've selected here are four of the primary noise complaints that Americans have. So here we're listening to the sound of the subway in New York City. So imagine spending three or four hours a day potentially commuting with extremely high background noise levels. Uh, so rail is a very important concern in communities. This audio here is actually footage of the elevated viaduct in Seattle. This is a structure that's going to be torn down in 2019, but in the meantime is very much creating lots of exposures for the surrounding community. People who live in cities often experience noise from construction sites, or in this case, uh, the sound of demolition of homes in the city of Detroit. So construction is very much a ubiquitous exposure as well. And finally, if you have the misfortune to live near a heliport or a hospital or an airport, 
you know that the sound of air traffic overhead can be uh, extremely overwhelming. So these are sources that we've known about for decades, but we're also introducing new sources. So I'm playing for you a sample here. I'll give you a second to perhaps guess what this might be. So you might think this is a dishwasher. This is actually the sound of a wind turbine generating energy at very close range. And so this is a type of noise that we haven't really had around us much in the past. But as we move towards more green and sustainable energy, we're now being exposed to new types of noise that we've never been exposed to before and potential health effects that we really don't know much about. So I'm a trained industrial hygienist. I focus on the, the health of workers over the long term and historically, what we've been concerned about with regards to noise is workers who have very high noise exposure. So here's a video clip of a worker working right here on the University of Michigan campus with a, a pretty high level uh, of noise. Again, this is an exposure that we've known about and worried about historically, but it's not just workers in factories that we're concerned about. Uh, now we're more concerned or more recognizing that workers around the world, including these small-scale gold miners in Ghana, are exposed to noise that we might just not have recognized historically, and we don't have to look uh, in other nations to find new emerging types of noise. This is a clip of a firefighter trying to uh, complete a training operation to cut a dummy out of a car. So emergency responders turn out to have quite extreme levels of noise. Uh, now, we do know from lots of historical data the level at which uh, people in the workplace start to develop a risk of hearing loss. That turns out to be about, uh, be about 85 decibels, or about as loud as standing next to a gas-powered lawnmower. However, we're learning that even if you're not above those levels, your hearing might not be at risk, but your heart might be at risk of a heart attack or hypertension. Uh, I've got here a graphic from a study that we conducted several years ago in New York City. What we're looking at on the lower axis of the graphic here is the noise level that a person is exposed to over an entire year. And on the vertical axis here, we're looking at the percent of people exposed. So we polled almost 4,500 New Yorkers and figured out what are they doing over the course of the year and how noisy is it. And in fact, when we estimated these people's exposure over an entire annual period, uh, we found that 9 out of 10 of these New Yorkers were over what we consider to be a safe limit. So if you look at this distribution, the red line is 70 decibels. We know if people aren't exposed over that level, there's no risk of hearing loss. Nine out of 10 New Yorkers were over a level that we know is harmful to people's health. If you think about any other type of environmental contaminant, we would never tolerate nine out of 10 people having a harmful exposure. But this is where we find ourselves with noise. And again, this is a limit designed to protect against hearing loss, but it doesn't protect against cardiovascular effects or those other impacts I talked about. So here at the University of Michigan, we are doing things to try to better understand the situation with noise. Uh, the graphic on the left here is showing noise levels that were measured by our Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So these are workplace noise levels collected over almost a 40-year period here. The good news we can see here is the red line is actually trending downwards over time. In fact, uh, between about 1979 and the early 1990s, we had quite a reduction in noise. That's great. We're making progress. Unfortunately, since the 1990s, you can see that the line basically flattens out. So we've got uh, room left for improvement. Uh, this is a, the result of a, a data uh, collection project that collected over a million measurements of noise. And now to help uh, the public and workplaces protect workers, we've created an online database so people can look up information about their own job. Uh, we've also, for the first time, now got national level noise maps. This one pictured here was created by the U.S. Department of Transportation. And so they've looked at two sources of noise, airports and roadways, and they've tried to visualize how many people are exposed in the United States in different areas. So the red coloration on this map indicates people with uh, potentially very harmful exposures. Yellow is less harmful and white is basically no exposure or no data. So again, for the first time, we can really start to zoom out out and ask how many people are exposed at the national level. I will, say, uh, I will say the work in my own laboratory and those of others around the U.S. is now focusing on new ways to measure noise. And so the picture on the left that you see here is a setup that we've done in a laboratory experiment where we tried to see how accurate can your smartphone be 
at measuring noise levels. And so we've actually found that the right combination of phone and app can make measurements that are almost as good as an off-the-shelf sound level meter. We're now taking the next step here. The picture on the right is a person wearing a traditional noise meter, but also wearing an external microphone connected to a smartphone. And again, we've seen in some circumstances that smartphone can do just as good a job as a several thousand dollar instrument, meaning that perhaps in the public we can start to protect ourselves by making measurements. I do want to mention there's a lot of emerging technology that I think holds a lot of promise for the public. So on the left here is one example. This is a Kickstarter project called DB Track that's designed to basically create a dose meter for you that will let you assess your noise from inside your MP3 earplugs, but also the sound around you. We've never been able to do this before. This is very exciting. There's a lot of apps now, for example, SoundPrint that you see here, that actually give you the power to look up restaurants and decide where do I want to go. Do I want a noisy restaurant this evening or do I want to go to a quieter restaurant where I might actually be able to talk to the people near me? And finally, uh, agencies like the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health on the right here are starting to create apps that are standardized and tested in a laboratory environment so you can actually trust the numbers you get off of your app and use those numbers to decide am I at risk or not. Now, the situation can sound pretty dire, but I do want to highlight there are solutions available here. So, coming back to my New York City clip here, this is an excessive exposure that could potentially cause hearing loss just from riding the subway each year. But it doesn't have to be that way. This is a recording from the city of Singapore. The volume is the same. You can just see they've actually designed the system so they're actually controlling the noise. It's held in by these glass doors. So the public has much less exposure. And I do want to sort of finish on a high note here. So the one shining spot of success we've had is with air traffic. So it turns out since 1981, we've reduced the number of people at risk of high levels of noise exposure from airplanes by 90%. This didn't just happen naturally, this happened by our government saying, we are gonna make airplanes quieter. We don't care how the manufacturers do it, but they will make these planes quieter. And so the manufacturers have moved away from old fuel inefficient turbo jets like you see here to more modern turbo fans. They burn less gas, they're more efficient, and they're much quieter. So there are solutions here. So just wrapping up, we've got a lot of future opportunities and needs. We'd love uh, to get people into environmental health to help us study these things. We do need to still get a better handle on how many people are exposed and to exactly what levels. We need to determine what fraction of the population is at risk of the various health effects I talked about. We need to start to investigate some of these new types of noise, again, wind turbines being an example. And overall, we want to get an estimate of what is the actual burden of disease. So how many people in the United States are getting sickened or killed by their exposure to noise so we can have even more ammunition to move us towards doing something about this problem. So I want to thank you for your time. I'd encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, also, if you have comments, again, please do enter those into the box. I, I will take a moment now. Uh, but before I do that, I want to thank you so much for your attention. And hopefully this has brought uh, some awareness to you about a, an issue that's indeed all around us, but that most of us don't think about very often. So with that, I'm going to pause and I will take questions from the audience here. And in fact, uh, we have one that's already arrived. So the, the question here is, what can I do to protect myself against noise? Again, this can seem like a, a pretty overwhelming problem. It, noise is all around us nearly all the time in the environment, but there are steps you can take. So uh, being conscious of noise, trying to move yourself as far away as you can uh, from sources of noise can be a great way to reduce your exposure. Uh, again, avoiding noisy activities in the first place. I don't wanna tell you not to go to concerts or clubs or, or have fun. Uh, but being aware of your hearing, and if you do go to those things, perhaps using hearing protection. That can sound pretty nerdy, but it turns out even for music venues, there are special types of protectors called musician's earplugs, many of which are transparent. So your friends don't even need to know you're wearing these uh, earplugs, but you're protecting your hearing while still preserving your ability to uh, uh, listen to the sound and enjoy the show. Uh, and finally, I do encourage people to just, again, think about noise in their environment. There are websites you can use if you're thinking about moving to a new location that can tell you how noisy that location is, so you can sort of choose your home 
home in a quieter area. And I also finally like to encourage people just to schedule some quiet time into their day. It's very easy to uh, get wrapped up in what we do and, and end up spending all day in noise, but your ears and your heart and your other bodily systems will really appreciate you spending some time in quiet. That can also be quite relaxing and, and that certainly has other health benefits. So I think that's the only question we've got for now. I will say if you wanna uh, continue to, to type in comments and questions here, we will monitor this over time and I'm happy to respond. Uh, and once again, I appreciate you spending a few minutes on your Tuesday afternoon with me here. Uh, and I, I do hope that I've uh, aroused an interest in noise and that this is something you can continue to learn about, perhaps even here at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Thank you so much.